Hello and welcome to the wonderful world of Innova, alive and composing with David T. Little. Would you please state your name for the record? David T. Little. Okay. Composer. <laughs> We've got to ask, what's the T for? Thomas. Thomas, all right. Yeah. Well, I've considered having it legally changed to just T. I thought that would be more interesting, but that hasn't happened yet. That would be very cool for your future career. <laughs> And we ask various impertinent questions to get behind the facade, the real person behind the composer here. And I would ask you, are you a cat or a dog person? No, I, but I don't imagine that you possibly could have any kind of household pet in your life. No, actually a cat. All right. I have a cat. And does that cat have an interesting and creative name that gets to, to, the, to the creative process in your life? Perhaps. Originally, uh, we were going to name her Lulu, and we thought that was a little too dark, so we changed it to Lola. But having just seen the Berg, so she has an operatic name. All right, keep guns out of the house, yes. and, uh, <laughs> and Lolita is not a, a good diminutive version no, of that. No. Uh, what's your first sound memory? First sound memory? That's an interesting question. I think the, the first memory, uh, the first sound that really had an impact on me musically in, in terms of my direction would be the sound of the fife and drum corps that I ended up playing with for about 10 years which I first heard when I was about eight years old in a parade in Newark, New Jersey. So fife and drum, I've got to anticipate soldier songs here and kind of a military gene, a meme at least, going on in your life. Yeah, I think so. I mean, fife and drum music was really important to me growing up, and I think that it actually is very present in the way I think about rhythm. Because that, that music tends to be very uh, rhythmically even, but with root, it's all rudimental drumming. I was playing snare drum, so the roles are very open and very... Um, you hear every beat as opposed to an orchestral role, which is much more close. So rhythm being um, sort of clear on every level was really important. Is there a certain sense of group, ensemble, control, um, uh, synchronization, and the things that it, as opposed to, you know, everybody improvises in their own way kind of yeah, thing? Yeah, I mean, it was very much about playing, you know, the idea that there are six snare drums and they need to sound like one drum, I think was really important. And also just the repertoire they were playing, I mean, we were doing Civil War and Revolutionary War music, so that's... The sort of, it doesn't really come out so much in my music now, but that's a repertoire that is really important to me that I sort of go back to now more for, for fun. Um, but I have a feeling it's going to creep out so, at some point in some piece. And you didn't turn into a Charles Ives and have multiple fife and drum chords? Well, some piece, I have an orchestral piece called Screamer that kind of is an Ives homage, so that does occur in that. And there's some fife and drum moments, but that's more based on circus music. Okay, so you, there you are as a snare drummer, mm -hmm. wearing a beautiful uniform. Right. Well, what came next? Uh, did you continue with the snare drum? Uh, yeah, well, then went to drum set. So then I started playing in rock bands and put my first rock band together in maybe middle school. And just kept playing in bands through, through high school and college, during which time I also started composing. So those two things kind of started around the same time and coexisted for quite a while. Um, but were separate, you know. And then at some point they started to blend more. Was there a one moment in your life uh, around this time when suddenly everything changed? You witnessed a work of art, you walked into a room and saw a picture, you read a poem, or you heard a piece of music, or you went to a show, you said, I can do that, I can do that better. Or there, there are a couple. I mean, the first one was the decision to become a composer, which came as, as a result of seeing Tim Burton's Nightmare Before Christmas, the score by Danny Elfman. And I was 15, and I walked out of the theater and said, oh, I'm going to be a composer. Uh, I couldn't really read music because all the fife and drum stuff had been learned by ear. Um, or by rote, but um, that was a moment, from that point on, that's just what I was going to do, and it was a matter of figuring out what that meant and how to do it and learning the tools. Um, and then for me with opera, it was actually going to see an opera scenes project at NEC when I lived in Boston and hearing, uh, of all things, the If I Loved You and You're a Queer One, Julie Jordan scene from Carousel, and just the way that the, the drama works in that scene is so fluid and so um, kind of perfect between spoken word and song and I was just really taken in and I thought, oh, that would be a really great thing to, to try. And that, so this was like 2003, and then I started writing soldier songs around 2004 or five. So it was pretty direct from carousel to soldier songs. I'm not sure how that actually, what sense that actually makes, but that's how, that's how it happened. And you had this epiphany. How did you follow up on that? Did you find a mentor or did you go to a school? Did... For to the decision to become a composer, uh, I just, I tried to read a lot of, uh, you know, what music, I found musicians who I thought were interesting and tried to find what they were listening to, and inevitably they were all listening to The Rite of Spring. And so I went very quickly from 
Um, and I already knew sort of the knitting factory scene here. I mean, I was really big into Naked City at the time and Bill Frizzell. So there was that, that world that I was already into. And then I sort of expanded that to include um, the Rite of Spring. So it was really Naked City and the Rite of Spring early on were the first sort of composed, the first things I thought of as really composed music in a, in a new music or classical music band. Did you have to get a whole new set of friends that uh, kind of uh, and came with your new operatic instincts? Or, or were they supportive uh, no, I mean, of your switch? They, you know, there were some moments in, in the band I was playing with at the time where I would introduce these really cool chords that I had heard in Stravinsky and they would be like, that sounds terrible, and we would argue about it. But generally, they were mostly accepting. Before there was soldier songs, there was um, Dog Days, right? Uh, well, Soldier Songs was written before Dog Days, but received its New York premiere after Dog Days. So Dog Days um, was composed between 2008 and 2012, and then premiered in the, this past fall. And what's your trajectory from this point? Because you, you seem to move pretty fast in leaps and bounds. A lot of big theater and opera projects on the horizon. Uh, we're here doing the first uh, libretto reading for Artaud in the Black Lodge, which is a piece I'm writing uh, with the wonderful Anne Waldman. Um, and that's going to be really exciting and really different than everything that I've done before. And that's sort of the point, is to find new ways of making interesting work. Uh, very collaborative. Um, and then uh, for the Fort Worth Opera in 2016, I'm writing an opera with uh, Royce Vavrick, who is the librettist for Dog Days, about the last day of John F. Kennedy spent in Fort Worth. Uh, so those are the two big projects, there's a bunch of other stuff that um, can't quite be announced just yet, but some chamber pieces, some uh, a violin concerto, a cello concerto, things like that, so all kind of big things, but um, exciting, you know, and all dramatic in some way. And how do you feel about the collaborative process, because uh, you are providing the, the, the music for, uh, and you have to work with you know, other people to, to make your vision come alive as well as theirs. How does that balancing act work out? And uh, uh... I think it's different with each with each project. But uh, you know, for Arto, I'm really entering it with no expectations. I just want to find something really great out of the process and make a really interesting work of art with an artist I think is really great and interesting. Um, with you know, so that we're kind of feeling our way through it, and we've talked a little bit about um, structure and planning. But it feels very open. Uh, with JFK, we uh, you know, are, it's a little more structured in terms of timeline for deliverable items for the company and in terms of um, plot points and things like that. So it, there's, I think, a, 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 and now I've been more involved in that outline than I think for the Arto outline. But they're both going to be, I'm really excited about both of them equally. I think they're going to be very interesting and exciting projects in their own ways. Do you have any words of wisdom or pearls to share if, if you were mentoring someone mm. uh, about your experiences so far? What, what are the... Uh, you know, the, the top one or two or three little tips that you would like to share at this point? I would just say listen to everything and try to, I mean, one thing I tell my students is that it's not really an acceptable, you know, as a student at least, it's not really an acceptable response to say, oh, I don't like this piece, because you can learn something about it, even if you don't like it, you know, so to dismiss something because you don't enjoy it in a, the way you would enjoy your favorite piece is, doesn't mean that you can't get something of value from it, so, um, and that's how I try to listen to things that I, aren't necessarily my thing, but there's value in, in everything. And so just try to find what is valuable to you for your own work um, as you sort of move, move through life as a listener. Would you like to give us the, the, the brief intro to, uh, to Soldier Songs and um, maybe highlight a track that we can go out with? Sure. Uh, well, Soldier Songs was composed between 2004 and 2006. It was the first piece, um, for my, really my first opera, although at the time I thought of it more as a, a staged song cycle. I wasn't calling it an opera yet. Now we're saying that it's an opera in the form of a song cycle, which I think is probably the most accurate. But it's taken a number of years to find that definition. Um, and it's, uh, it came from a, a, a personal need to understand a conflict in my own life between my youthful opinions of war and the fact that I knew so many people, both family members and friends, who were fighting them you know, fighting in either Iraq or had fought in Vietnam or World War II, you know, and trying to really bring those two conflicting ideas um, into some sort of consonance. I don't think it quite did that. I think that the piece really leaves some tension and it's sort of unresolved. Um, but um, but it, it gets through a lot, goes through a lot of interesting points along the way. So um, I think, you know, um, Still Life with Tank and iPod and Two Marines are sort of the the singles 
from the record, I guess. Um, and uh, Still Life with Tank and iPod is inspired by use of heavy metal in sort of military life. And then Two Marines that tells the story of Carlos Arredondo uh, in sort of abstracted ways um, and his experience when he was informed that his son had been killed. Well, it's certainly a wonderful way to, to pose questions in, in, a, in an area that's often oversimplified. So. And I know the work is having a big impact right now, so congratulations Thank and you. thanks for talking with us today. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks so much.